Section 10 of State of the Union Addresses by United States Presidents, 1934 through 1945. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Franklin D. Roosevelt, January 7, 1943. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the 78th Congress. This 78th Congress assembles in one of the great moments in the history of the nation. The past year was perhaps the most crucial for modern civilization. The coming year will be filled with violent conflicts, yet with high promise of better things. We must appraise the events of 1942 according to their relative importance. We must exercise a sense of proportion. First in importance in the American scene has been the inspiring proof of the great qualities of our fighting men. They have demonstrated these qualities in adversity as well as in victory. As long as our flag flies over this capital, Americans will honor the soldiers, sailors, and marines who fought our first battles of this war against overwhelming odds, the heroes living and dead of Wake and Bataan and Guadalcanal, of the Java Sea and Midway, and the North Atlantic convoys. Their unconquerable spirit will live forever. By far the largest and most important developments in the whole worldwide strategic picture of 1942 were the events of the long fronts in Russia. First, the implacable defense of Stalingrad, and second, the offenses by Russian armies at various points that started in the latter part of November, and which still roll on with great force and effectiveness. The other major events of the year were the series of Japanese advances in the Philippines, the East Indies, Malaya, and Burma, the stopping of that Japanese advance in the Mid-Pacific, the South Pacific, and the Indian Oceans, the successful defense of the Near East by the British counterattack through Egypt and Libya, the American-British occupation of North Africa, of continuing importance in the year 1942 were the unending and bitterly contested battles of the convoy routes and the gradual passing of air superiority from the Axis to the United Nations. The Axis powers knew that they must win the war in 1942, or eventually lose everything. I do not need to tell you that our enemies did not win the war in 1942. In the Pacific area, our most important victory in 1942 was the air and naval battle off Midway Island. That action is historically important because it secured for our use communication lines stretching thousands of miles in every direction. In placing this emphasis on the Battle of Midway, I'm not unmindful of other successful actions in the Pacific, in the air and on land, and afloat especially those on the Coral Sea and New Guinea and in the Solomon Islands. But these actions were essentially defensive. They were part of the delaying strategy that characterized this phase of the war. During this period, we inflicted steady losses upon the enemy, great losses of Japanese planes and naval vessels, transports and cargo ships. As early as one year ago, we set as a primary task in the War of the Pacific, a day-by-day day and week-by-week week and month-by-month month destruction of more Japanese war materials than Japanese industry could replace. Most certainly that task has been and is being performed by our fighting ships and planes, and a large part of this task has been accomplished by the gallant crews of our American submarines, who strike on the other side of the Pacific at Japanese ships, right up at the very mouth of the harbor of Yokohama. We know that as each day goes by, Japanese strength in ships and planes is going down and down, and American strength in ships and planes is going up and up, and so I sometimes feel that the eventual outcome can now be put on a mathematical basis. That will become evident to the Japanese people themselves when we strike at their own home islands and bomb them constantly from the air. And in the attacks against Japan, we shall be joined with the heroic people of China, that great people whose ideals of peace are so closely akin to our own. Even today we are flying as much lend material into China as ever traversed the Burma Road, flying it over mountains 17,000 feet high, flying blind through sleet and snow. We shall overcome all the formidable obstacles 
and get the battle equipment into china to shatter the power of our common enemy from this war china will realize the security the prosperity and the dignity which japan has sought so ruthlessly to destroy the period of our defensive attrition in the pacific is drawing to a close now our aim is to force the japanese to fight last year we stopped them this year we intend to advance turning now to the european theater of war during this past year it was clear that our first task was to lessen the concentrated pressure on the russian front by compelling germany to divert part of her manpower and equipment to another theater of war after months of secret planning and preparation in the utmost detail an enormous amphibious expedition was embarked for french north africa from the united states and the united kingdom and literally hundreds of ships it reached its objectives with very small losses and has already produced an important effect upon the whole situation of the war it has opened the attack to what mr churchill well described as the underbelly of the axis and it has removed the always dangerous threat of an axis attack through west africa against the south atlantic ocean and the continent of south america itself the well-timed and splendidly executed offensive from egypt by the british eighth army was a part of the same major strategy of the united nations great rains and appalling mud and very limited communications have delayed the final battles of tunisia the axis is reinforcing its strong positions but i am confident that though the fighting will be tough when the final allied assault is made the last vestige of axis power will be driven from the whole of the south shores of the mediterranean any review of the year nineteen forty two must emphasize the magnitude and the diversity of the military activities in which this nation has become engaged as i speak to you approximately one and a half million of our soldiers sailors marines and flyers are in service outside of our continental limits all through the world our merchant seamen in addition are carrying supplies to them and to our allies over every sea lane few americans realize the amazing growth of our air strength though i'm sure our enemy does day in and day out our forces are bombing the enemy and meeting him in combat on many different fronts in every part of the world and for those who question the quality of our aircraft and the ability of our flyers i point to the fact that in africa we are shooting down two enemy planes to every one we lose and in the pacific and the southwest pacific we are shooting them down four to one we pay great tribute the tribute of the united states of america to the fighting men of russia and china and britain and to the various members of the british commonwealth the millions of men who through the years of this war have fought our common enemies and have denied to them the world conquest which they sought we pay tribute to the soldiers and flyers and seamen of others of the united nations whose countries have been overrun by axis hordes as a result of the allied occupation of north africa powerful units of the french army and navy are going into action they are in action with the united nations forces we welcome them as allies and as friends they join with those frenchmen who since the dark days of june nineteen forty have been fighting valiantly for the liberation of their stricken country we pay tribute to the fighting leaders of our allies to winston churchill to joseph stalin and to the generalissimo Chiang kai shek yes there is a very great unanimity between the leaders of the united nations this unity is effective in planning and carrying out the major strategy of this war and in building up and in maintaining the lines of supply i cannot prophesy i cannot tell you when or where the united nations are going to strike next in europe but we are going to strike and strike hard i cannot tell you whether we are going to hit them in norway or through the low countries or in france or through sardinia or sicily or through the balkans or through poland or at several points simultaneously but i can tell you that no matter where and when we strike by land we and the british and the russians will hit them from the air heavily and relentlessly day in and day out we shall heap tons upon tons of high explosives on their war factories and utilities and seaports hitler and mussolini will understand now the enormity of their miscalculations 
that the Nazis would always have the advantage of superior air power, as they did when they bombed Warsaw and Rotterdam and London and Coventry. That superiority has gone. Forever. Yes, the Nazis and the fascists have asked for it, and they are going to get it. Our forward progress in this war has depended upon our progress on the production front. There has been criticism of the management and conduct of our war production. Much of this self-criticism has had a healthy effect. It has spurred us on. It has reflected a normal American impatience to get on with the job. We are the kind of people who are never quite satisfied with anything short of miracles. But there has been some criticism based on guesswork and even on malicious falsification of fact. Such criticism creates doubts and creates fears, and weakens our total effort. I do not wish to suggest that we should be completely satisfied with our production progress today, or next month or ever, but I can report to you with genuine pride on what has been accomplished in 1942. A year ago we set certain production goals for 1942 and for 1943, some people, including some experts, thought we had pulled some big figures out of a hat just to frighten the Axis, but we had confidence in the ability of our people to establish new records, and that confidence has been justified. Of course, we realized that some production objectives would have to be changed, some of them adjusted upward and others downward. Some items would be taken out of the program altogether, and others added. This was inevitable as we gained battle experience and as technological improvements were made. Our 1942 airplane production and tank production fell short numerically, stress the word numerically, of the goal set a year ago. Nevertheless, we have plenty of reason to be proud of our record for 1942. We produced 48,000 military planes, more than the airplane production of Germany, Italy, and Japan put together. Last month, in December, we produced 5,500 military planes, and the rate is rapidly rising. Furthermore, we must remember that as each month passes by, the averages of our types weigh more, take more man-hours to make, and have more striking power. In tank production, we revised our schedule, and for good and sufficient reasons. As a result of hard experience in battle, we have diverted a portion of our tank-producing capacity to a stepped-up production of new, deadly field weapons, especially self-propelled artillery. Here are some other production figures. In 1942, we produced 56,000 combat vehicles, such as tanks and self-propelled artillery. In 1942, we produced 670,000 machine guns, six times greater than our production in 1941 and three times greater than our total production during the year and a half of our participation in the First World War. We produced 21,000 anti-tank guns, six times greater than our 1941 production. We produced ten and a quarter billion rounds of small arms ammunition, five times greater than our 1941 production, and three times greater than our total production in the First World War. We produced 181 million rounds of artillery ammunition, 12 times greater than our 1941 production, and 10 times greater than our total production in the First World War. I think the arsenal of democracy is making good. These facts and figures that I have given will give no great aid and comfort to the enemy. On the contrary, I can imagine that they will give him considerable discomfort. I suspect that Hitler and Tojo will find it difficult to explain to the German and Japanese people just why it is that decadent, inefficient democracy can produce such phenomenal quantities of weapons and munitions and fighting men. We have given the lie to certain misconceptions, which is an extremely polite word, especially the one which holds that the various blocks or groups within a free country cannot forego their political and economic differences in time of crisis, and work together toward a common goal. While we have been achieving this miracle of production during the past year, our armed forces have grown from a little over two million to seven million. In other words, we have withdrawn from the labor force and the farms some five million of our younger workers, 
and in spite of this our farmers have contributed their share to the common effort by producing the greatest quantity of food ever made available during a single year in all our history i wonder is there any person among us so simple as to believe that all this could have been done without creating some dislocations in a normal national life some inconveniences and even some hardships who can have hoped to have done this without burdensome government regulations which are a nuisance to everyone including those who have the thankless task of administering them we all know that there have been mistakes mistakes due to the inevitable process of trial and error inherent in doing big things for the first time we all know that there have been too many complicated forms and questionnaires i know about that i have had to fill some of them out myself but we are determined to see to it that our supplies of food and other essential civilian goods are distributed on a fair and just basis to rich and poor management and labor farmer and city dweller alike we are determined to keep the cost of living at a stable level all this has required much information these forms and questionnaires represent an honest and sincere attempt by honest and sincere officials to obtain this information we have learned by the mistakes that we have made our experience will enable us during the coming year to improve the necessary mechanisms of wartime economic controls and to simplify administrative procedures but we do not intend to leave things so lax that loopholes will be left for cheaters for chiselers or for the manipulators of the black market of course there have been disturbances and inconveniences and even hardships and there will be many many more before we finally win yes nineteen forty three will not be an easy year for us on the home front we shall feel in many ways in our daily lives the sharp pinch of total war fortunately there are only a few americans who place appetite above patriotism the overwhelming majority realize that the food we send abroad is for essential military purposes for our own and allied fighting forces and for necessary help in areas that we occupy we americans intend to do this great job together in our common labors we must build and fortify the very foundation of national unity confidence in one another it is often amusing and it is sometimes politically profitable to picture the city of washington as a madhouse with the congress and the administration disrupted with confusion and indecision and general incompetence however what matters most in war is results and the one pertinent fact is that after only a few years of preparation and only one year of warfare we are able to engage spiritually as well as physically in the total waging of a total war washington may be a madhouse but only in the sense that it is the capital city of a nation which is fighting mad and i think that berlin and rome and tokyo which have had such contempt for the obsolete methods of democracy would now gladly use all they could get of that same brand of madness we must not forget that our achievements in production have been relatively no greater than those of the russians and the british and the chinese who have developed their own war industries under the incredible difficulties of battle conditions they have had to continue work through bombings and blackouts and they have never quit we americans are in good brave company in this war and we are playing our own honorable part in the vast common effort as spokesmen for the united states government you and i take off our hats to those responsible for our american production to the owners managers and supervisors to the draftsmen and the engineers and to the workers men and women in factories and arsenals and shipyards and mines and mills and forests and railroads and on highways we take off our hats to the farmers who have faced an unprecedented task of feeding not only a great nation but a great part of the world we take off our hats to all the loyal anonymous untiring men and women who have worked in private employment and in government who have endured rationing and other stringencies with good humor and good will yes we take off our hats to all americans who have contributed so magnificently to our common cause I've sought to emphasize a sense of proportion in this review of the events of the war and the needs of the war. We should never forget the things we are fighting for, but at this critical period of the war, 
we should confine ourselves to the larger objectives and not get bogged down in argument over methods and details we and all the united nations want a decent peace and a durable peace in the years between the end of the first world war and the beginning of the second world war we were not living under a decent or a durable peace i have reason to know that our boys at the front are concerned with two broad aims beyond the winning of the war and their thinking and their opinion coincides with what most americans here back home are mulling over they know and we know that it would be inconceivable it would indeed be sacrilegious if this nation and the world did not attain some real lasting good out of all these efforts and sufferings and bloodshed and death the men in our armed forces want a lasting peace and equally they want permanent employment for themselves their families and their neighbors when they are mustered out at the end of the war two years ago i spoke in my annual message of four freedoms the blessings of two of them freedom of speech and freedom of religion are an essential part of the very life of this nation and we hope that these blessings will be granted to all men everywhere the people at home and the people at the front are wondering a little about the third freedom freedom from want to them it means that when they are mustered out when war production is converted to the economy of peace they will have the right to expect full employment full employment for themselves and for all able-bodied men and women in america who want to work they expect the opportunity to work to run their farms their stores to earn decent wages they are eager to face the risk inherent in our system of free enterprise they do not want a post-war america which suffers from undernourishment or slums or the dole they want no get-rich-quick era of bogus prosperity which will end for them in selling apples on a street corner as happened after the bursting of the boom in nineteen twenty nine when you talk with our young men and our young women you will find they want to work for themselves and for their families they consider that they have the right to work and they know this after the last war their fathers did not gain that right when you talk with our young men and women you will find that with the opportunity for employment they want assurance against the evils of all major economic hazards assurance that will extend from the cradle to the grave and this great government can and must provide this assurance i've been told that this is no time to speak of a better america after the war i'm told it is a grave error on my part i dissent and if the security of the individual citizen or the family should become a subject of national debate the country knows where i stand i say this now to the seventy eighth congress because it is wholly possible that freedom from want the right of employment the right of assurance against life's hazards will loom very large as a task of america during the coming two years i trust it will not be regarded as an issue but rather as a task for all of us to study sympathetically to work out with a constant regard for the attainment of the objective with fairness to all and with injustice to none in this war of survival we must keep before our minds not only the evil things we fight against but the good things we are fighting for we fight to retain a great past and we fight to gain a greater future let us remember too that economic safety for the america of the future is threatened unless a greater economic stability comes to the rest of the world we cannot make america an island in either a military or an economic sense hitlerism like any other form of crime or disease can grow from the evil seeds of economic as well as military feudalism victory in this war is the first and greatest goal before us victory in the peace is the next that means striving toward the enlargement of the security of man here and throughout the world and finally striving for the fourth freedom freedom from fear it is of little account for any of us to talk of essential human needs of attaining security if we run the risk of another world war in ten or twenty or fifty years that is just plain common sense wars grow in size in death and destruction and in the inevitability of engulfing all nations in inverse ratio to the shrinking size of the world as a result of the conquest of the air i shudder to think of what will happen to humanity including ourselves if this war ends in an inconclusive peace 
and another war breaks out when the babies of today have grown to fighting age. Every normal American prays that neither he nor his sons nor his grandsons will be compelled to go through this horror again. Undoubtedly a few Americans, even now, think that this nation can end this war comfortably and then climb back into an American hole and pull the hole in after them. We have learned that we can never dig a hole so deep that it would be safe against predatory animals. We have also learned that if we do not pull the fangs of the predatory animals of this world, they will multiply and grow in strength, and they will be at our throats again once more in a short generation. Most Americans realize more clearly than ever before that modern war equipment in the hands of aggressor nations can bring danger overnight to our own national existence or to that of any other nation, or island, or continent. It is clear to us that if Germany and Italy and Japan, or any one of them, remain armed at the end of this war, or are permitted to rearm, they will again and inevitably embark upon an ambitious career of world conquest. They must be disarmed and kept disarmed, and they must abandon the philosophy and the teaching of that philosophy which has brought so much suffering to the world. After the First World War, we tried to achieve a formula for permanent peace, based on a magnificent idealism. We failed, but by our failure we have learned that we cannot maintain peace at this stage of human development by good intentions alone. Today the United Nations are the mightiest military coalition in all history. They represent an overwhelming majority of the population of the world, bound together in solemn agreement that they themselves will not commit acts of aggression or conquest against any of their neighbors, the United Nations can and must remain united for the maintenance of peace by preventing any attempt to rearm in Germany, in Japan, in Italy, or in any other nation which seeks to violate the Tenth Commandment, Thou shalt not covet. There are cynics, there are skeptics who say it cannot be done. The American people and all the freedom-loving peoples of this earth are now demanding that it must be done, and the will of these people shall prevail. The very philosophy of the Axis powers is based on a profound contempt for the human race. If in the formation of our future policy we were guided by the same cynical contempt, then we should be surrendering to the philosophy of our enemies, and our victory would turn to defeat. The issue of this war is the basic issue between those who believe in mankind and those who do not. The ancient issue between those who put their faith in the people and those who put their faith in dictators and tyrants. There have always been those who did not believe in the people, who attempted to block their forward movement across history, to force them back to servility and suffering and silence. The people have now gathered their strength. They are moving forward in their might and power, and no force, no combination of forces, no trickery, deceit, or violence can stop them now. They see before them the hope of the world, a decent, secure, peaceful life for men everywhere. I do not prophesy when this war will end, but I do believe that this year of 1943 will give to the United Nations a very substantial advance along the roads that lead to Berlin and Rome and Tokyo. I tell you it is within the realm of possibility that the 78th Congress may have the historic privilege of helping greatly to save the world from future fear. Therefore, let us all have confidence. Let us redouble our efforts. A tremendous, costly, long-enduring task in peace as well as in war is still ahead of us. But as we face that continuing task, we may know that the state of this nation is good. The heart of this nation is sound. The spirit of this nation is strong. The faith of this nation is eternal. End of section 10